To reach the summit, you pass a narrow couloir overhung by seracs called the bottleneck. High altitude, falling ice, and steepness make this stretch an extremely dangerous part of the expedition. The bottleneck is located just over 1,000 feet below the summit. On the morning of August 1st, dozens of climbers start their push for the summit. And the often unpredictable weather on K2 is for once on the same side as the expedition. You couldn't have asked for a better day in a million years. It was, it was perfect. There was no wind. The sun was out, bright, shining. You know, you would dream of having this summit day. But because it was so perfect, I think people stopped questioning themselves. The group decision-making applied more so than ever before. Of people were making the, well, you know what? It's a perfect day. Everybody's here. It's perfectly safe. What can go wrong? Despite the great weather, everything's not right. The first group of climbers left three hours late. They spent valuable time looking for missing equipment. Now it's clear that if they reach the summit, no teams will be able to climb down before dark. We are on 7,900 meters, something like that. And uh, this is one of my more, more disappointing days I had for a very long time. Total miscommunication when it comes to gear and who should bring it. We short of rope, we short of gear, and we are way ba back in time. We are really late. I don't know what we're gonna do. I had left a little bit before Eric and Fred, and so I had seen them turn around. And I'm looking at this group of people who are just, you know, they're not moving fast. It, it just doesn't feel like anybody's moving fast. It's just not working. It, the time doesn't look right. And I'm looking up and I'm saying, we're not gonna get back down through the bottleneck by dark. And I don't think that's safe. I think we need to turn around. I'm looking up, I'm like, it's just not looking right. We're trying to figure out what's just happened in the bottleneck here. We're to a stage here where, uh, you know, over 8,000 meters there at the bottleneck. And uh, it doesn't take for much to go wrong to be catastrophic. Yeah, Searing, this is Eric Camp Uh Do you know if there has been an accident? Over. Is he in the rock? We got a radio call from the bottleneck that there was a person who had been falling at the fixed ropes while trying to go around and pass another member. It was Serbian climber, Dren. He unclipped from the rope and passed uh, Cecilia from Norway at the bottleneck and uh, somehow slipped. He was just tumbling down longer than 200 meters. I see up uh, down. Yeah. yeah. The rock. Dren Medrick, uh, when he was falling, he was just, you know, three meters uh, away from me. You know, we were on the rope and everybody was just beneath me and uh, some uh, climbers above me. And he was just le left of the rope, and I, I don't know what he was doing, but the, the, the time I, I heard a, a scream, I was looking, and I, I saw that he just, uh, you know, he, he slipped, and it was just tumble over. And, and, and it was, yeah, it was a really stupid moment, because he was so close that you were thinking, oh, hey, give me a hand, and, 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 and he was gone. Yeah, we can, we can see, uh, we can see a, uh, a lone figure down in the rocks. Uh, at the bottleneck. He's moving. He is moving over. Dren was still moving. Yeah. So Fred and I made the decision to climb up and see if we could help Dren back down to Camp 4 safely. The decision to try and bring him back down to Camp 4 is something that we have to deal with the consequences of that. 
coming up to that spot, I see Iso from Serbia is dragging a person that is partially wrapped up. And then I understand that, okay, it's too late. Dren's body is wrapped in red plastic. Four other climbers gather around him, ready to bring him down. So I get up there and they um, urge to bring him down to base camp. But I say that, hey, that, that's impossible. We can bring him down to camp four if everyone's in for it and give him a worthy burial there instead of just leaving him on the hillside like this. And that's what we start to organize to do. The Serbians and Frederick start bringing the body down. Two fronts, two here and two here. And the body's down here. And we're lowering him down. It's fairly steep here. Guys, if you do fall, you release, OK? It's, 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 it's our lives, too, OK? Yeah, yeah. Remember. OK, slowly. <sighs> I just feel a huge load on my back. Stop! 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 The Pakistani high altitude porter is falling into my back. And then he grabs the rope around my legs. And I can feel his entire tension of his body on my legs, plus the body from the Serbian dead climber. And some of the Serbians now on the left side is also losing their tension on the rope, which means that a lot of weight is put onto my legs, and I'm screaming out. Release the rope! Release the rope! Release the rope! And then... Uh, he just... loses the grip of the rope. And... Uh, start falling down. Jesus Christ. Stop! He passed uh, probably within 10 meters of me. I think he was probably um, in, an, in some degree of shock, uh, emotional shock, and also extremely exhausted. And those things might have contributed to him not being able to stop himself. Despite the horrific events taking place beneath the bottleneck, Wilco and most of the others decide to push for the summit. We talked about it, you know, what should we do? And then uh, we said, hey, listen, uh, you know, all the surf climbers are going back, so, you know, we can't, you know, do anything anymore. You are that far on the mountain, you know, that it's very hard to take the decision to going back because, you know, this is K2 and you don't get a second chance. And, you know, so we were thinking, if we reach the summit, you know, just before darkness, you know, we have a headlamp and all the ropes are there, you know, we can make it. I, I look up and we still see this lineup of people going up across the traverse. And it's almost three o'clock. It's late. I can't believe they're still going up at this time of day. They're going to be summiting at nightfall which they did. At 7 p.m., Wilco and the other climbers finally reached the summit. It was... The morning after reaching the summit, Pemba, who managed to climb down in the dark, has chilling news. The climbers in Camp 4 prepare for the worst. Yeah? When we... Uh... When Pemba reaches the bottleneck, he discovers that icefall from the Serac had completely severed the rope. The first icefalls caused several climbers to tumble to their deaths, including Norwegian climber Rolf Baia. The missing rope makes the climb down to Camp 4 extremely difficult and dangerous. A number of climbers are now stranded close to the summit. <sighs> you 
Using their last bit of strength, the climbers in Camp 4 head down to base camp. Eleven people have already died on the mountain. Now Wilco and several others are stuck above Camp 4, struggling to stay alive. We get a phone call from Holland saying Wilco's calling his wife. When people call their wives on a mountain after spending the night out, that's not a good sign. You know, that's a giving up sign. That's a, I just want to hear my wife's voice one last time. Dutch climber Wilco von Royen, separated from the other climbers on the mountain, prepares for a second night outside at 26,000 feet. Time is running out. It was the worst night of my life. I was in, in a bad shape, uh, in a terrible situation, and, and I knew that I was fighting against the wind because this little bit wind was, you know, that, that was making it so cold. On August 3rd, Wilco is finally rescued. Several days after setting out to reach the summit, Wilco and his team member, Kaz, arrive at base camp, severely frostbitten. I remember Wilco asking about the fate of the others up on the mountain. This was a moment where he was realizing just how poorly the experience had gone for many of the others that had summited. We had to tell him that uh, 11 people were known to be dead. After the rescues and after everything and relieving base camp, I felt it was really important for me to go and say goodbye. So I, on the hike out, on the day we were walking out, I actually walked to the Gilkey Memorial. And I was there by myself, and there was 11 new names. When I first went, there were plaques that represented people. Now there are people, and all that was left was plaques. And that was the thing that I really had to, to, to come to grips with. Wilco's frostbite injuries require a large piece of his foot to be amputated. Frederick, Eric, and Chris make it off K2 without any permanent physical injuries. <laughs> 